Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this second night of the three-day weekend uh, observance of Jesus, uh, most important part of his life, the, as he goes to the cross for us. And tonight, is, uh, we, we observe Good Friday. Uh, last night, you, we observed Monday, Thursday together, and uh, there was uh, lots of participation. And tonight is going to be the same way. Uh, we have uh, made candelabras for you with seven candles and uh, hopefully many of you have these. If you, if you didn't have a chance to get one, uh, maybe you have candles around your house, or you can even just watch and observe the candles as, the, as they are extinguished on, on the screen. Most importantly tonight, we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross using his seven last words. We hope this is a meaningful experience for you tonight. A reading from the Gospel of John. So the soldiers, their commanding officer, and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. First, they took him to Ananias, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at the time. Caiaphas was the one who had told the other Jewish leaders, it is better that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of the disciples. The other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching the gate, and she let Peter in. The woman asked Peter, You're not one of the man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I am not. Because it was cold, and the household servants and guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. Inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he had been teaching them. Jesus replied, Everyone knows what I teach. I have preached regularly in the synagogues and the temple, where the people gather. I have not spoken in secret. Why are you asking me these questions? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. Then one of the temple guards standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way to answer the high priest, he demanded? Jesus replied, If I said anything wrong, you must prove it. But I am speaking the truth. Why are you beating me? Then Ananias bound Jesus and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire warming himself, they asked him again, You're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, No, I am not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately a rooster crowed. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, What is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus replied, 
Is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, So you are a king? Jesus responded, You say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them, He's not guilty of any crime. But you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, No, not this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, King of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, Look, here is the man. When they saw him, the leading priests, the temple guards, began shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. The Jewish leaders replied, By our law, he ought to die because he calls himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? Then Jesus said, You would have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leaders shouted, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was now about noon at the day of preparation for the Passover, and Pilate said to the people, Look, here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him. Crucify him. What? Crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the leading priest shouted back. Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. A reading from Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all.
next word is from Luke chapter 23, verses 26 to 34. As they led Jesus away, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country just then, was forced to follow Jesus and carry his cross. Great crowds trailed along behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains to fall on them, and the hills to bury them. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. Finally, they came to a place called the Skull. All three were crucified there, Jesus on the center cross and the two criminals on either side. Jesus said, Father, forgive these people because they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. I confess to God and to all of you that I am a sinner. Honestly, I sin every day. It says it in the Bible. It's what we confess together in church. And I understand that I sin in my thoughts, in my words, and my actions, and what I have done and what I've left undone. I haven't loved God as I should, and I haven't loved others in my life as he tells me to. Right now, I'm choosing to include you in my confession because I'm not alone. It's not that I like revealing to you all the ways that I mess up because there are plenty. I can be impatient, irritable, selfish, mean, preoccupied with my own agenda for my own life. My list could go on. And as you listen to this, please don't just say, yes, I agree with you, or yes, I'm the same as you. The point is, we all have our own things to confess. We all have our own situations to work out with God, our own need to come clean. He empties me of all the ways I mess up, even though I try to hide some of it. He knows. It's not so much that God needs me to tell him, it's that I have a need to come clean. Yes. I am a sinner, but that does not define me. It's not the whole story. It's not the last word. What's so amazing is even though he knows about it all, it doesn't change how he feels about me. He loves me. And how do I know this? He sent his son to die on this day in history. The Bible says the greatest love is that someone would lay down his life for a friend. I am his friend, and you are his friend. Jesus is a friend of sinners. He chooses to walk with us, and by his Holy Spirit, he always intercedes for us every day and every moment. Nothing can ever separate us from his love. It's the deepest, fullest, and most most fulfilling friendship you and I can ever have. Our secrets are safe with him. He knows our greatest dreams and he knows our biggest fears. So now, on this day when we remember Jesus' death, I hear very good news. God, who is rich in mercy, loved loved us even when we were dead in sin. And he made us alive through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It is by grace that we have been saved through faith. In the name of Jesus and by his authority, our sins are forgiven. That is what now defines us. Amen. The second word, 
Luke 23, verses 35 through 43. The crowd watched, and the leaders laughed and scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's chosen one, the Messiah. The soldiers mocked him, too, by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A signboard was nailed on the cross above him with these words, The King of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself, and us too, by the way. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God, even when you are dying? We deserve to die for our evil deeds, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. word from John 19, 25 through 27. So that is what they did. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Woman, he is your son. And he said to this disciple, She is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. Survey the 
fourth word comes from Matthew 27, 46 through 47. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema shabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling out for the prophet Elijah. Jesus' loneliness is ultimate loneliness. We've all experienced loneliness as physical absence, but there is a deeper level. And it's a feeling of disconnectedness, alienation, even the sense of being entirely misunderstood. Isaiah told us that, that he was despised, rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. At this moment, the connection that he has had with the Father and the Holy Spirit is silent. Jesus, the Son, calls on his Father and there is no answer. All the torment and guilt that come with bearing the sin of the world is laid upon him at this moment. He had never experienced guilt and torment for sin before and now it is the accumulation of all the sin past, present, and future that he is bearing. Jesus pays the price that we deserve to pay. He experiences an excruciating loneliness for you and for me. Take this moment to experience silence. Thank Jesus for what he suffers for us. The fifth word comes from John chapter 19, verses 28 and 29. Jesus knew that everything was now finished, and to fulfill the scriptures he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips.
sixth word from John 19, 30. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. From John 19, we read, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put it on a hyssop branch and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished it is, is actually one Greek word, te telestai. It is finished, it is stands finished, it always will be finished. And with this word, Jesus knew that he'd completed his mission on earth. Actually, Jesus spoke several times about his mission on earth. We remember back when he was talking to the woman, on the, woman at the well in John chapter 4. He told her, he says, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me, and from finishing his work. And right before he goes to the cross in his prayer, in John 17, Jesus prays, he says, I brought you, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. It is finished. These are not words of defeat, although sometimes people can read them as such. They're not about just the end of a life. And by the way, Good Friday is not misnamed at all. Some people might put Jesus in the category of a person who gave his life for a good cause, but Jesus was not a martyr. He's the savior of the world, of everyone. This was his mission, his plan. A martyr is someone who, who loses their life for, for something that they believe in. But no one took his life. Satan didn't take it. Jesus voluntarily gave it up. And it's a shout of victory and accomplishment and not a whimper of defeat. You know, God has made thousands of promises to us in scripture. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, he says, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And that's through his death and resurrection. Scholars tell us that there are 350 prophecies alone about the Messiah in the Jewish scriptures in the Old Testament, and they're all fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So what did Jesus actually accomplish? What, what, did, what did he finish? Let's dive just a little bit deeper into that tonight, and I think we need to first understand a little bit more about God to understand what Jesus accomplished. First of all, God is a God of order. Back in creation, when God created the universe, his, his creation was, was not chaotic. That, that is, God created the universe with an order. There's an order to the physical world. There's an order to physics and chemistry and biology. There are mathematical and physical and even economic laws. And there are spiritual laws too. Along with the order and the laws, there are consequences when the order is violated. For, for instance, um, there are laws that govern your body. There's a law that people need to sleep. Now, <laughs> I can violate that law, but, but who loses out? It's not God. I will eventually lose, and I suppose the people around me will lose out too. I might try to defy gravity by jumping off a 20-story building. And someone might ask me about halfway down, at about the 10-story mark, how's it going? And at that point, I'd say, wow, it's going great. But eventually, we know this is not going to turn out well. There are consequences to, to violating, violating God's order, in, even in the spiritual realm, too. One of the uh, things that we know is that sin always separates. It separates people from people, and it separates people from God. Apostle Paul in Romans 3 writes, he says, For the wages of sin, the, the consequences of sin, is death. 
which is another way of saying separation from God. The second thing we know about God is that God is also a God of justice. Uh, that is, when someone steals, when someone takes advantage of another person or abuses them, when we see people going hungry, there's something inside of us that just says, that should not be, that's not just, that's not fair. And that sense of justice and fairness comes from being born in God's image. That's the way God is too. And when we see it happen in someone else, it's so much easier to see the brokenness. But honestly, when we're honest, we're part of that brokenness too. And though we're born in God's image, we also break God's laws as individuals. We sin. We don't love others as we should. And we live in and are participants in this broken, unjust world. We are guilty and we all deserve to pay the consequences. But that brings us to the third observation about God. God is a God of love and forgiveness. Let me repeat what I said before on the second one. It says, we deserve to pay the consequences. But God said, you know what? I love people so much. I love you so much. I love the whole world so much. They can't pay, so, so I will. In fact, I'm going to do it in such a way that it's unmistakable how much I love them. I will give my one and only son as a sacrifice to pay the penalty, to cancel the debt. And so that's why we call this Good Friday. It's because Jesus paid for us. He took our sin to the cross and we don't have to be separated from God. We can be connected to him forever in a relationship through faith in Jesus. In Romans 8, uh, verse 3, we, we read these words. It says, The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his only son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. In a much shorter verse, Paul says in Colossians, he says, uh, he, says he, Jesus, canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. You see, Good Friday is really good. His forgiveness means that he has forgotten your sin and my sin. The record has been canceled. When God thinks about you and me, he's not mad and disappointed with us. He thinks about how much he loves us and how much he wants everyone in the world to know his love. Jesus suffered for us on the cross and he asks us then to take up our cross and follow him by loving others. And because he loves us so much, he doesn't want us to keep destroying ourselves. He wants to continue to change each of us to be more like Jesus in every way. If God can turn what seemed to be a really bad Friday into Good Friday, imagine what else God is able to do. We know that he is able to do amazingly more than we could ever ask or imagine. It is finished. The final word comes from Luke 23, 44 through 56. By this time it was noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the thick veil hanging in the temple was torn apart. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with these words, he breathed his last. When the captain of the Roman soldiers, handling the executions, saw what had happened, he praised God and said, Surely this man was innocent. And when the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw all that had happened, 
they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the woman who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish High Council, but he had not agreed with the decision and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he had been waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of rock. This was done late Friday afternoon, the day of preparation for the Sabbath. As his body was taken away, the woman from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where they placed the body. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to embalm him. But by the time that they were finished, it was a Sabbath, so they rested all day as required by the law. Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God, our sin and our debt, overcoming Jesus. Here is our King, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, 
overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails. Our sin stopped his heart. And yet, this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday.